I've got two sessions, two, look, two things to t talk about now. One is how to trade in the dropping market, which could be quite relevant, I think, at the moment. Yeah? And the other is um, coming out of a recession. I've got nothing about a hot market, to be fair, but I will mention the hot market. What is a hot market? Hot market is when things are, you can't go wrong. Okay. okay. So why don't we just talk about the hot market first, yeah? And then in somewhere along the line, I think we just want to talk about just some joint ventures and... Just, yeah, because some people might do joint ventures and, and we can touch on that and I can always talk to you more about another time or whatever, but would that be useful? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Okay, all right. So, okay, in a hot market, okay, when I mean by hot market, I mean a market where um, anybody can make money out of property. My dog's called Ivy and she's very sweet, a labadoodle, and in a hot market, if, if Ivy could put a paw on a contract, she can make as much money as the rest of you. She genuinely could. And she'd be wagging her tail and smiling, similar to, you know, Chris here when we were talking about what he's doing earlier. So it isn't difficult. Any, anybody can make good money in a hot market. It isn't difficult. The trick is to know when to stop. And what you find is people in a, in a market is really racing away and... You know, they're telling everyone at the, at, at the dinner table, the, at the um, dinner parties, oh, I've just made, I've just made 100,000 out of buying two flats and sold them with a flip them within a year and all this, yeah? It's, that market is no good for me. I can't make any money in that market because everyone's out there, it's too, everything's too hot, I might as well go home. I cannot make any money in a hot market. I can't make any more money than you. And I've got 40 years experience, so that can't be right. So if it sounds too good to be true, it is. If my dog could put a paw on, don't forget what I said, and, and sign a contract, she could make money. And she's a dog. So, clever dog, but still a dog. So, that will not last long. And when it stops, it normally reverses. So... What, how, what do we know? What do we know? What are the signs when things are starting to get a little bit sticky? Obviously, the property that you have put on the market and, and sold within a week is now taking two months, maybe. The economic situation from the government, although they're, they're of course, in, in denial as well, they want it to keep going. There, there's a few telltale signs from the government, perhaps, that things aren't quite so good. Could be that in, across the world things aren't so good. But the one simple thing I look at is new car sales. Because if the new car sales start to drop dramatically, and I know you'll say, well, at the moment they're dropping, which they are, but that's more to do with diesels and so on. But if the, if the car market is dropping, then normally property follows within a year. The good news is that you'll know now when pop, when car prices, car sales start going up, guess what? Property just follows. Spot on, Chris. So you can get in there and fill your boots before everyone else <laughs> because you will not be in recession like everybody else. And the reason for that is because you're here listening to me today. So Anticipate the problems. It's better to stop buying early than it is too late. Yeah? Would everyone agree with that? Yeah. It's like a gambler. Roulette. They've won three on the row, on red or whatever it might be. One more, one more, one more. I used to go to Ireland a lot. And every time I went, I got to know lots of people in Ireland. And every time I went, they said, oh, here comes, the, here comes the English property boy. Thinks he knows about the market. Keeps telling us it's too hot in Ireland. The market's too hot. Well, I got it wrong by two years. In Ireland, they used to keep their flats clean. And what they meant by that was they never rented them out. Because the hot market was that hot in Ireland, they didn't want to mess their flats up at all. They weren't bothered about any rent. All they wanted to do is buy it. Keep it, sell it a year or two later for a huge profit. And I was in the car with a friend of mine, and he'd bought a flat four years earlier 
for about 160,000 in Ireland. And this is honestly true. And he's on the phone. Oh, I'm not taking less than 900. I'm not taking less than 900. What's all that about? Anyway, he comes off the phone. I said, what's all that about? Oh, I bought this flat, he said, like five years, four or five years ago, uh, for 160. But I'm not taking less than 900 for it. That's how hot the market was in Ireland. It was amazing. These people were making a fortune. But what they do, they don't get out. So he sold the flat for 870, thought he'd done badly on it, by the way, and then bought another one for 900, bought a property, another property for 920,000. Recession, overnight, poof. Banks went bankrupt 2009, eight, you know, we all know the story. His house he bought for 925,000 was worth 280,000 if he could sell it. If he could sell it. It's now come back up because what Southern Ireland have done, they've got a 12.5% corporation tax, which they're not meant to have. They've got all the, they've got all IBM and everyone else has gone there. Uh, and and it's, it's fueled the property market again. And I think now, I spoke to him the other week and he thinks his house is worth 600. So it's come back. But that's taken quite a few years. So, you know, if no one has traded through a property recession, how many people here have traded through a property recession? Very good. Well, I've not tra I haven't traded, but I have invested. Yeah, same thing. Chris, you must yeah, have done. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I didn't trade. Yeah. Well, I've I lost my shirt. I nearly lost my shirt. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I did not do well at all. Um, I mean, I was very built bought my first property within a month it, the price had gone down by about 50k yeah there you go so 50, listen 50. it can happen to it can happen to all of us all i'm saying is we don't want it as a group we now don't want it happen to us so this is how we this is so this is what we do so when you hear things are too good to be true they are too good to be true and it won't last forever it won't last very long yeah i'm not saying don't get involved in it get involved in it but make sure you get out first, because when it goes, it can go quite quickly. I've survived three recessions, and it can go quickly. They've all been a bit different, to be fair. So, be ruthless. Well, hopefully, some of you in the room are a bit more ruthless than you were when you walked in. Would you agree with that? A bit more business-like? Yeah? It's, them all, it's you or them, really, and it doesn't want to be you, does it? Yeah? So, you've got to look after yourself. Good luck after what you do. You know, it's not a hobby. Remember that. It's a business and it needs to be treated as such. Be business-like. Be fair. You can be tough and you can be fair as well. You don't have to be, no, you know, you don't have to, just because you're tough and relatively ruthless probably, it doesn't mean you can't be fair with it. And that's where I think, you know, some people misunderstand, you know, what, what happens sometimes. And of course, if you're not if you're not ruthless in a dropping market, uh, then you really are going to be in trouble. And if you want to be everyone's friend, yeah, but poor, congratulations, because that's how to do it. Be soft. You've got to be ruthless in a tough market, otherwise you end up with no shirt, literally. So, when you realise things are not going well, cut, cut, and cut, and I mean prices. So, say you've got 10 properties, yeah, and you're geared at 70% on all of them, and you hear things aren't, aren't going well, and you've seen the signs, put four on the market, or five on the market. Get, get them on the market, and get them on at sensible prices. Because what you, you need to be the cheapest house on the market for what it is, okay? Because within six weeks, that will look expensive. So you need to be, you're chasing the market down. You want to get under the market, and you might find that hard to take, but you want to be under the market in order to sell. The ones who bury their head in the sands, yeah, who deny there's a problem, which will be most of the estate agents for a start, because it's their livelihood, till it's too late. The ones who bury their head in the sands, the ones who think, yeah, there is a bit of a problem. I'm going to put it on the market, but I want that for it. In the end, they take less than you. A lot less, because you've got out. And by the way, when you've got out, 
you can then either use your, your, the spare cash you've got, say you sell five, left with five, to reduce the borrowings on the others, yeah, and sit and enjoy the ride, because you've got no problems. You don't want to be buying anything, because the market never catch a falling knife, the market's dropping, so you don't want to be doing that. Go and do something else, go on holiday. I started ra training racehorses for two years. That's the most expensive two years. I might have carried on bloody um, tra <laughs> dealing, to be honest with you. Although we did buy Auction House UK in the recession and so on. So, and I give you a slight exaggerated example probably here, but, but really, if things are, if you can liquidate everything, you'll be a brave person to liquidate everything because you always want, oh, I need, you know, you're a deal junkie, you want some property, you, it may not happen, you know, we think it's going to happen, but so most people hedge their bets and don't sell everything they've got because of the tax situation as well. Probably made a lot of profit, it's gone up a lot. So, but certainly <coughs> sell half your stock, get the cash in, sit and wait. Wait and wait and wait. Trading in a market that's dropping is very difficult and it's not for everyone. Yes, you can do it, but it's very, very hard. It's far better to wait. Go and do something else. Go and take up that hobby that you've always wanted to do and you've never had the time to do it. Go away from the situation. Walk away. The rest of you, all your friends can't walk away because guess what? They haven't done what you've done. They're firefighting. They've got the bank on the phone every five minutes. They're, you know, they've been put in special measures by the bank. They might lose their house because it's personally guaranteed. All these things can happen and have happened. All these things have happened, I promise you, and can happen to you if you're not prepared and you're not organised. The good news is, when the market comes back and you've got some capital, you're going to make a lot of money. I've made more money out of coming out of recession than any other time, ever. Ever. John, I mean, you've got to be able to read the market pretty well, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Because yep. that, that is surely, you know, the, the most important part of it, is that market yes. intelligence. No one rings a bell at the top. No, they don't, you know, so... I like that, Andrew. Yeah. It's not my phrase, I no. agree with Well, that's it. okay. <laughs> So where do you think we are at the moment? I think every part of recession is reciprocal, 10, 15, 20 years. The reason it hasn't happened yet, probably, is because interest rates are incredibly low. Normally another telltale sign is when mortgage, when, when people buying five times their income. It's a good sign. If you look, no one has ever, if once you're in up to five times your income, six times it was, I think, in the... 2007, something like that. Have a look back. Do your research. Then at that point, it's too good to be true. How can you go and buy six times? You know, it's just madness. 100% mortgages. Who the hell? Yeah. The difference this time is the difference this time is that interest rates are very, very low, incredibly low. I mean, in the 1990s, Chris remember 1990s. Um, I wouldn't say Victoria does, of course. Um, but interest rates were 15. Interest rates were 15 percent. Yeah. People can't believe that. Yeah. That oh, interest rate. Oh, I'm paying 1.9 percent mortgage. Well, great, good for you. We were paying, and that was a building society mortgage on that, on my house. So people don't really, people don't understand what can happen. I'm not saying I don't think interest rates will will do that by any means. They won't. They'll stay very low. If you look at the five-year term for long-term borrowing, long-term money, you're the accountant. It's very low. So I don't think they're anticipating that. But it doesn't mean there won't be a recession. There's a property recession between every 10 and 20 years. The, in, the interesting thing at the moment is you've got the government 10 billion help to buy. That's holding up the bottom of the market. There's now more first-time buyers buying in the UK than any time since 1995. Is that because of help to buy distortion? That's because of the help to buy the government and no investing statute. in first-time buyers. And you get no... Not exactly. So... So there's that, there's low interest rates, and the other thing is the bank of mum and dad. Because <coughs> mum and dad are refinancing the houses in order to help the kids. Done it. Done it. There we go. Victoria's done it. She's kind. I'm not sure Chris has. He looks a bit more hard-nosed than that. I read, the other day, <laughs> I read the other day it's the ninth biggest lender in the UK. Exactly. What, and that, 
So a lot of people aren't borrowing anything like 95% or 100%. They're borrowing 70%, 75%. There's very few repossessions. Although they have ticked up. They have ticked up and they will continue to tick up. And, and then we will have a recession. If I was a betting man, I'd say not three to four years. But when I was Bank of Mum and Dad, yes. or Bank of Mum, yes. um, I didn't actually put it in his name, I put it in my... Yeah, good advice, because if he falls in love... Yeah, exactly. Land, land all of Mum. If he falls in love... If he falls in love... Yeah, half gone. Half gone. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, at that time when I was working at the airport, and uh, when I bought my first flight, I was 18, and um, one of the guys said, mortgage yourself as much as you can, and blah, blah. And actually, I did a shared ownership scheme, because yeah. that was what they had on then. Yeah. And I remember when the interest rates went up. It didn't matter to me, because I was going to live there anyway. I wasn't, you know, so I know the mortgage went, went up, but whatever. But he committed suicide, the guy that told me that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Very sad. There's very lots sad. of very sad cases. So, accept the market. You're not going to beat the market. You're not better. No one is better than the market. You, if you, whether you think your house is worth two hundred thousand or not, yeah. If you think your house is two hundred thousand, who cares what you think? Who cares what I think it's worth? The only who cares what a valuer thinks. The only person that matters is the person who wants to buy it, because they're the ones who are paying it. And if no one wants to pay you 200000 for your house, then guess what? It isn't worth 200000 Whether you think it is, Chris thinks it is, Victoria thinks it is, Patrick thinks it is. It's, it's worth whatever someone's willing to pay. And in a falling market, where's the bottom? Never catch a falling knife. So it, whether you think something's cheap in a falling market, unless you've got deep pockets and you're going to rent it out and say, you know what? goes down a bit more, I'm not worried, I know it's going to come back a bit, that's different. But I'm assuming when not many of us are in that position, because when, when one thing goes wrong, everything tends to go wrong. So if you've got other businesses and things, they probably aren't strong either. So, you know, it's what you've got to remember. However, like I said, the good news is, you and now have done the right thing, and coming out of the recession, is great fun. Great fun. So, we've already said, never catch a falling knife. Wait. When people say the market is coming back, don't jump in. God, I was so desperate to jump in. I'm a deal junkie. I live off doing my deals. But I waited until it bounced. Because I, in the early 90s, it bounced. But then went down again. Yeah? It kept bouncing up a little bit, then down. A dead cat bounce. Thank you very much, Andrew. You've been very helpful all day. <laughs> so, the key is, let someone else take a risk first. Let them put their toe in the water. You don't have to put your toe in the water immediately. Don't forget, you don't think it's all going to come back within six months. It'll take two or three years probably to come back. London market's slightly different. That is much quicker both ways, I think. But around the country, it isn't going to come back like that. You've got time. And yes, it will improve. And you'll make less money towards the end of it than you will to start with. Because towards the end of a recovery, there's other people coming back in the market. All those people probably who, who, have, who the, bank have, uh, the bank have taken all their properties back and written everything off, they've probably found some money from somewhere. And they're within the second year of the re recovery, third year, they're probably back in. But you would be in there for you'll be in there for a year and a half before them or two years, and you, there are huge potential auctions is massive in them in those days because there's half the buyers, yeah, too many properties, not enough buyers in a recession coming out of a recession. There is so many opportunities during the recovery of a recession, and as I said over the years I've made far more money during that period of time than I ever have in a hot market. No competition, huge opportunities, big margins. Your margins, mar margins aren't going to be 20, 25% then. <laughs> Your margins are going to be 35, 40%. No competition. Why pay more than you need to? Don't Patrick's, Patrick's going to have a field day. Don't you find it hard to get funding because normally the monetary 
my yeah. is looser. There is always, mind. Andrew, there's always money around for people to know what they're doing. And when you tell them the story, when you tell them that, I saw the market, I saw what was happening, you won't mention my name, of course, because it will be, be your idea, not mine, this, by that point. Uh, and I saw what's happening, so what I did, I reduced my borrowings, I reduced what I was doing, and now the market's coming back, and now I want to get back into it. Most banks are going to think, wow, these people know what they're talking about. They're going to be confident to lend to you because of your experience and your knowledge and what you've achieved. You can always find joint venture partners, and I think we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. So, um, any questions on both those? So, recession and coming out of recession. Anybody got any questions on that? Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm wrong? So, what, where would you say we're at at the moment? I think we're probably three or four years off recession. But I don't have a. I don't have a. I mean, the profit car sales have gone down, but that's more to do with probably um, diesels and all that's going on around diesels. But but it does also say that the market isn't as good as it was, and you've got to be careful. What happens in London eventually happens to the rest of the country because it's a wave effect. <coughs> now, London, there's a few reasons why it's happening: uh, stamp duty, um, lack of foreign buyers. But that's at the top end, of course, normally. Lack of foreign buyers, Brexit. Low yields. Low yields. Someone else came up with another one the other day I hadn't thought of. I can't think what it is. Affordable housing. Affordability. Yeah. But it's not yeah. only for over 60s. But the great, okay, just because you're not, there's no need to not start yet. talking about people. <laughs> so, oh. nearly are. So, um, okay, so, so what I'm really saying is, yes, there are, ex there, there are exceptions, I know, but on the whole, what happens in London happens everywhere else eventually. Anything over a million outside London is tricky to sell because of the stamp duty. This government have put a lot of stamp duty. A lot of you know they've they're not getting the revenues they thought they were going to get. Um, they they want to slow down the London market. They've certainly achieved that by 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 upping the stamp duty and so on. They've achieved that. Um, they wanted to slow down the help to buy. Uh, sorry, the buy-to-let market, they've managed to achieve that by charging a 3% um, levy on everybody. But they've got to be careful, and they obviously try trying to get more first-time buyers and less buy-to-let investors, which they have achieved, to be fair to them. They're not quite as stupid as they look, some of them. Uh, they do know what, some of them know what they're doing. And the housing minister at the moment, Kit um, Malthouse, is actually very good, I think. I've had a couple of meetings with him, and he is very, I think he's very good. The problem with the housing... Uh, ministers, we've had five in seven years, I think. It's crazy, but he seems very good and very on it. Now, she keeps firing him all that. Well, she'll be fired soon herself. <laughs> don't worry about that. Be she'll be gone. <laughs> she's still in power. I don't think so. I think she. I think she. I think she thinks she is. Yeah. She's like that cat that keeps bouncing. So any questions? So any questions? Yeah. Any questions on recession, going into it, coming out of it? I was just thinking about coming experiences. Out, what's yeah. The property type. So yeah, you know, would you focus on a particular property well, type? Well, yeah, that's a very good question, Chris. What happens is there's a lot of part finished property where the banks have pulled the people in. Because what happens in a recession is the real idiots go first. So the bank, the, ba the people who've, who have done um, conversion, say, a conversion, uh, aren't very organised, borrow the money at too much interest rates, um, don't know what they're doing. They're the first to be picked off by the banks. You know, they're the first to go. Then the second, the second lot of people go, um, as, as we get deeper into recession, the ones who haven't done a bad job but just being a bit, a bit unlucky, can't sell what they've got, they go. Then the third tranche of people, who are quite good quality and know what they're doing normally, if the market goes down 40%, they go too. You, you, and actually you get to a point, some people get to a point where actually they've got some cash left, they go, actually, well, let's let all that go because we're going to be underwater for five years with it. In other words, it's not going to come up to what, it's, what we owe on it for five, seven years. So let's, let's clear our decks, keep the cash we've got, and start buying again. In fact, some of them end up buying the same properties back that they've been repossessed on at auction. 
Yeah? So it, it really just depends. But I would say the most common thing for us all in this room are things that are properties that are half finished. Because they're the ones that tend to go first because they're vulnerable, aren't they? You know, they're in a situation where um, you know the half they can't sell them the half finished, they can't sell them, they probably got the building costs right. In, in, in a hot market, of course, they can get out of trouble because suddenly, because it's worth more than it was when they, what they thought. So they can get out. These people, uh, the people that aren't very good, can get out in a hot market. They can get away with it. But in a bad market, they can't. They're totally exposed. Totally exposed. You're waving at me, yes? No, that, that was a half-finished one, wasn't it? Prime example. So we bought that. We, that was late coming back, but that, that went bust in the recession, uh, and we bought it in 2000, 2015. It was, uh, the frame. That frame cost £7 million to build in 2006. Yeah. We paid £1 million for it. We paid £1 million for it in 2015. And we couldn't afford to pay more than £1 million for it to make the project stack now, by the way. Well, you couldn't afford to. Is it no, more? £1 million was enough. It was the second one, second was move. The second. The first lot are idiots. Yeah, the second. The second <laughs> lot aren't quite sick. Aren't quite sick. They, they haven't listened to me either. They're, they're sort of, um, they're not too bad, but they're, they're just getting caught because of the market, you know. Oh, right. So, they're, so, so um, That's it. and then the third lot are the ones who are actually very good and actually realise that they're better to dump it all to start again because the market's dropped 40%. It might not, it might only drop 10%, 15%. We don't know, do we? No one's got a crystal ball. Do you, do you think there's a, a sort of a, a loan to value mark that if you're quite cautious or if yeah, fifty percent, fifty percent, that's what I'm fifty percent yeah, okay. or less. Fifty percent or less, you should never be in trouble, should you? Really, but of course, most people are borrow seventy percent. Okay, but if you can keep it to fifty percent, you can normally ride away. You can normally ride away, but what you might do is sell. Is if you've got ten, sell five, reduce the borrowings to less than fifty percent, and hopefully have some capital left as well. If your yield was good, then you can ride out pretty much anything. Yeah. yeah, you can. Well, you can to a point. The yield's fine, but if if your property was worth two hundred thousand, it's now worth one hundred thirty-five thousand. And you owe 150 on it, you're going to be underwater for a number of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bank might, the bank might, might Probably turn a blind eye. Blind eye. You'll be the, you'll be the last people they come to. But they'll come to you. Yeah. And they'll come to you and say, well, we need, we need this revalued, that revalued. Oh look, you either got to put more money in or a bigger guarantee to them or something. We've all been there. I've been there where, you know, they've come to you and go, well, right, okay, John. Yeah, well, you're paying your interest, it's no problem, but hang on, loan to value. It was 60%, it's now 80%. We need some personal guarantees off you. In 2007, I had no personal guarantees. Borrowings of 20 odd million odd, no personal guarantees. I thought, this is great, no personal guarantees. Sold a few things, you know, we're not too bad. But the banks wanted their money back. That's what you've got to remember. You, even if you may not be in any trouble, but the bank could be. Less likely this time around because they've sorted themselves out. But the banks wanted their money back. Bank of Scotland said to us, look, John, um, you owe us four or five million. Uh, we're going to revalue what you've got. So they revalued a block of flats in Brighton. And interesting, Brighton didn't go down in the recession. It held itself. So, and we hadn't had it valued for three years. So they went down, they valued it, and said, well, there must be something wrong. Well, why is that? Oh, because it's worth, it's been valued at more than, than, than uh, we've got it in our books at. I said, well, that's probably because... It hasn't been valued for three years, and the market in Bryson haven't got that. No, no, that's not right. Had it revalued again, cost us another 25,000 quid or something, because they won't pay for the valuations. They take it out of the account. Oh, no, well, that, that's true. Well, it hasn't gone down. No, okay, we accept that. Oh, and by the way, we still want our money back in six months. So we had to refinance. Well, luckily, we could refinance. The good news is we had two valuations. Mm. So we could refinance. It wasn't a problem to us. So, you know, it, everyone can get sucked in somehow. So just be very, very wary of that. So, um, can I ask you just one quick question? A very quick question. What time is it? What's yes. your sort of feeling on, on investing abroad, though, in property abroad? Why is would, you, why would you want to invest in property abroad? You've got the most amazing right, property okay. market in the in the world. Yeah. Okay. You've got hundreds of. I just wondered if it was something got, you did. You've got hundreds of companies who will lend you money. Hundreds and hundreds of building societies at incredibly low interest rates. You've got a market 
that is regulated, that you know goes up and goes down. You want it to go up and down because you make more money that way. Okay. If it just goes up, if it's Holland, boring Germany, yeah. where you know the interest rate they they, they say you can have a one percent increase uh, in the rent in the rent every year. How boring is that? I went to funny you should say. I went to buy a block of flats in Holland many years ago. A friend of mine bought quite a few. I went to buy this big block in Holland in the early 90s when I thought I was Charles Frere from Harold's Way. And I, <laughs> so I went there. We'll explain that later, the letter to you. So, if you can't remember Charles, do you remember Charles Frere? Harold's Way, there you go. I thought I was Charles Frere because I had the same car. But I didn't have the same looking girlfriend, to be fair. Anyway, that's another story. So. Um, I went there, but you know, people don't buy flats in Holland. They, they rent them and then they have a place in the country. <coughs> Not like here. This is the most fantastic, yeah, fantastic property market in the world. That's why everyone wants, wants to invest into mm. it. It's amazing. So you don't, need to, you, don't, you don't need to get a flight or a boat. Just stick to the UK. Get the UK right first. Uh, if you want to buy something Good abroad, advice. buy something abroad to enjoy. And if it goes up, it's a bonus. So. Shall we talk about joint ventures and partnering people? Would that be good? Yes. Yeah? Please. Okay. So, I've had uh, joint venture par partners, backers if you like, you might call them joint venture partners, uh, for over 35 years. And I've had three different parties who have backed me certainly for over 30 years. So, um, and what you find with backers is that you need to get their trust. You need to trust each other. You need to do different things. There's no point having someone who does the same as you, doubling up all the time. So most of the backers I have, and my business partner as well, um, have been financial. So I've gone and done the deal, found the deals, done the deals. I'm very, very spoiled. I go and do the deals, all the nice bits, shake people's hands go around the country looking at property, buying it, saying, yeah, we bought this, get it funded, please. Lovely. I've been spoiled. So, but they are all on the financial side. I don't have a checkbook. I don't want a checkbook. Do I need to see the accounts? Not really. It doesn't really interest me that much. It's all about what you do. So my job is finding the deal, doing the deal, getting it sorted and selling it. Their job is to say, John, here are the figures, it doesn't work out, you need to get it cheaper or we don't do it, we walk away or whatever it might be, that's their job. I go and see a merchant bank, and the merchant banks aren't many of those left either now, London, I get wheeled in by them, say this, this and this, don't say anything else, I haven't told them about that, I said right, I wheel in, shake hands, have a bit of lunch, hopefully they like me, walk out, don't say anything in the lift either because they might have a microphone in the lift. Wait till you get outside on the street and then go, that was all right, wasn't it? We, we got the money we wanted or whatever it might be. Okay? So that's, that's been my role. Now your role, um, Paul for instance, your role might be different to that. I don't know. We've got an accountant here. We've got uh, Patrick who's a, got financial side to him as well. So you know, everyone here has got different skills. And some of you might um, join venture with someone more like me who's out there doing deals now and you, but you can put the funding together or you might decide the other way everyone's different and and you will naturally find your 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 what you what you what you're comfortable with and the person you're comfortable with and of course if you're doing things together one it can be more fun because it can be quite lonely secondly you're sharing the risk uh, and which is you know can be good uh, you're sharing the profit as well, of course. So if you're a very greedy person, that's not so good. If you're willing to share a bit, then then that's that's probably good. And you can, you know, if they they bring the funding in, you're putting the expertise in, then you can buy without any money, can't you? You've learnt, you know, you can do it without any funds if someone else is putting the funds in for you. So um, the one thing I would always say about uh, backers, uh, and I'm assuming here that someone else is going to find the money and you're putting the expertise in for the, for the moment is that always start off with a small project with them even if they want to jump in halfway up the ladder don't 
Start off lower down, because you, if you say to them, well, yeah, but I'd rather start a bit lower, that gives them confidence. If you say to them, oh, I want to start here, I want to borrow, you know, let a million pounds, and do, no, start lower than they'll be happy with. That way they're super, super uh, comfortable with what you're doing. So start lower. Don't try and be ambitious with them. The first deal, you want to make it so safe as houses, excuse the pun, but also profitable but under promise and over deliver. So tell them it's not quite as good as it should be, or might be. Don't go trying to impress them and say, oh, it's gonna be, we're gonna make 35% on this. When it comes to the 25, they'll go, yeah, well, that's all right. <coughs> if you say, look, this one's a little bit tighter than some we might do, but it's the first one, up. we'll get to know each other. Very important you get on with them as well. Because once you start working with someone, a bit like being married, isn't it? You start to know more about them, and, and they might be on the phone every minute to you, they might be chasing, you don't want that. So if you do a small deal and it works out fine and you get on well, great, you can then do a bigger deal. If you do a small deal and they're a right pain in the arse all the way through. You have to have the honeymoon period first before you get married. Yeah. Before you get married. Very true. <laughs> yes. Very true. As soon as you've exchanged contracts, things sometimes change. So. Um, <laughs> So, uh, it's important, I've lost my train of thought there, so it's, very, so it's important to have a really good relationship with them, and, and that is, doesn't mean that they're your best friends, it doesn't mean you're out on a Saturday night having a drink with them, you don't want that relationship with a backer. You want to have a respectful relationship, if you get too close to someone like that, then you lose that, there are lines of respect and there's lines of, you know, how you work and you don't want that distorted in any shape or form. So my backers, on the whole, I see them, we go have lunch, we talk about it, and they go, yeah, that's fine, John. Do they come and look at every deal I do? No. Do they need to? No, because they trust me and what I do. Uh, and if I say, look, it's gonna cost us 50 grand more, and I thought, it's fine, John, don't worry about it. Because I have that with trust and respect between us both. So they know, if I say something, I mean it, I'm not exaggerating, and if I say there's a problem, <laughs> I mean there's a problem, um, but I hope to sort the problem out before I tell them, that's not being deceitful, uh, if you tell them every little thing, uh, that, they don't want that, they're backers, they don't want to know that you've had the breakfast, they couldn't care less, and if you're not doing a deal with them, they don't care less either by the way, they'll find someone else who will. So, one of the criticisms I have of myself over the years is that I've probably done too much with backers. But when you get backers, they need to be fed. These people want to, want to make money out of property. They don't want to do it themselves, but they want you to do it. And if you don't feed them enough deals, they'll find someone who will. So every time you get a good deal, you know, I'll do this one myself, which I can do and I do do, but quite often, I've got to keep him happy, I've got to keep her happy, otherwise they'll go off and I won't have them again. Now, finding backers and doing joint venture partners is so much easier now than it's ever, ever been before. It's a huge opportunity for you all. In the old days, finding a backer, you know, finance on financial, it was hard, it was difficult. Now, there's also equity deals you can do, there's people to people lending, there's all sorts of things out there you can do. It really has changed for the better. But, the, but it still has to be, the principles are the same. So, what are they? Paul, what are the principles of joint, working with joint venture partners? Well, you said about establishing the, uh, sort of the trust base and complementary yeah. skills. Honesty, yeah. Inte yeah. honesty, integrity, um, transparency. transparency. If there's a problem, sort it out. It's your problem to sort any problems out, not theirs. Confidence. Confidence. Confidence comes with... Uh, um, under promising and uh, uh, over, I said the right way, over delivery, yeah. So, so that comes with that. So, you build your confidence up with them. Don't start off with a big project, start off with a smaller one, yeah. Agree with that? Everyone agree with that? It sounds sensible? I think so. Yeah? yeah. Build their confidence up in you, especially if you haven't done that many deals. And on the um, property elevator show that we do where we, where we fund deals, the person you're lending to is as important as the deal. They can have a fantastic deal, but if they come in and go, oh, you know, this, 
if you don't have a rapport with them, if you don't connect with them, uh, if they don't give you confidence, it doesn't matter how good the deal is, are you going to give them that money? No, you're not. You're not going to do it. So you're lending, you're lending to that, the person as much as the deal. And you need to, you need to, you've got to rely on that person. They've got to, they're putting a lot of trust in, if we're, if we're all out there doing, defining deals and we're talking about people lending money into the deal, they all are putting an awful lot of trust in all of us. And you need to respect that. Uh, and, you know, when they say jump, you jump. And you jump as high as you need to. Um, because ultimately, whatever we might think, they have the key. Because without the, without the funding, you ain't going to be doing the deal. So, you know, so that's very important. In terms of how you structure a deal with them, if I tell you what I do, yeah, and then you can say, well, things have moved on a bit, John, you don't need to do that anymore. Um, so what I do is this. I like to give them super confidence. So <coughs> if I'm saying I'm buying something for £750,000 and it's half a million pounds to refurbish and I'm selling them and we've got £2 million worth of resales or whatever, yeah? So what I what what I what I do if I'm first of all I don't put any money into any of the deals I do with other people. They always in the past new new backers might say, Oh John, I want you to put 10, 20% in. I want you to have what's called skin in the game. Yeah? I say, no, I don't I'm not doing that. I don't need to do that. You know, I've worked very hard for 40 odd years. I don't need to be putting money into deals that I'm doing with other people. I put the expertise in, the experience, you put the money in. But what I do do is I guarantee my share of the loss. Okay, which gives them confidence. So if something goes wrong, you know, I should be on the line. It will be my fault as much as it is theirs for lending me the money. So I should take some of the punishment. So what I do, I, I suggest that they buy it in their name or their company. So it's their, they own it. I don't own it. They own it. I then have an agreement with them, a very straightforward consultancy agreement with them that any lawyer can draw up very quickly that just says, and I charge nothing, I don't take any money out of the deal until it completes. So if you start saying, well, I want a thousand quid a month for overseeing it and this, they will soon lose confidence with you. So if they say, look, we'll give you 500 pounds a month for overseeing it, that's slightly different. But I always say, I don't want any money for overseeing it at all. I take my share at the end and that varies from 50% share of the deal down to probably a third, depending who I'm dealing with and whether we're just buying it and selling it or whether we are developing it. Uh, and all the time scars I give them are very straightforward and, as we've said earlier, always extend them a little bit. Because what you don't want is disappoint them at any stage. Okay, once I've, you know, I've known some for over 30 years now, we've made a lot of money between us, and yeah, that's a bit different for me now because I can say, look, you know, I've got this one wrong. It's going to be another four months. I'm really annoyed about it. And they'll, you know, because they know me and, and trust me. But to start especially, make sure you give them confidence. So let them buy it in their name. Have a joint venture agreement with them, yeah, that says that on, after, after all costs and after you've given them interest on their money, and we mentioned this earlier, very important, if they've got a million pounds, Okay, they can't get much money on the on, in interest, but but it, their money is still worth a lot a lot to them. So, and if you didn't have that money, you'd be using a bank. So offer them a ten percent interest, roll that up so they you only pay it at the end. So that way, uh, they own it. They're getting interest on the deal, and they're getting fifty percent share of the profit, and they own it. I then invoice them at the end, consultancy fee, for half the profit, once all costs, and I mean all costs, are taken out. So they get, they get their money back, they get their interest, all costs, of, or everything. We then sit down, have a bit of lunch, you in, invoice them the day before, they tell you exactly how much it is, I don't normally check it, but you might want to check it as you go, it's fair enough. And uh, let's see, there you go, John, thank you very much. Or nowadays, they send it, don't they? Now, so they get ten percent interest yeah. per month per year yeah. plus half the profit as well. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, they deserve at least that. In some cases, I only get a third of the profit. They take the rest. So if people are yeah. doing deals like this on crowdfunding sites, then you typically sort of pay between 10 and 20% in interest debt with no profit share on top. Yeah. So you're giving these guys quite a lot more money than... Yeah. But that's why I've had them a long time, isn't it, probably? But you're quite... By comparison, you're, you're pretty aggressive with buyers when it comes to prices. It seems take that as a comfort. It seems... Yeah, but it seems... There seems to be a disparity between you, you, you treat different groups of people with varying degrees of ruthlessness. Yes. Why, why aren't you just yes. equally harsh with all of them? Yes, because because my backers are in, are in my team. Uh -huh. They're my team. If you remember the first thing we spoke about today, might be the second thing, putting a team together. Yeah. Yeah. A backer is part of that team, and you'll do anything for your backer. You'll do anything. Uh, loyalty, you know, they look after you, you look after them. Okay. It's us against everyone else. But it does appear that you're paying substantially over market rates for these factors. It's not like... I'll take like that into account. Is, it's not like everyone else is paying 10 and you're paying 12. Yeah. It's like the effective rate. Yeah. It's like you're, everyone else is paying 10 and you're paying 27. It, yeah. The difference is enormous. But I suppose it's the ratio yeah. and what you're looking at as you know, like ten percent of a hundred thousand or ten percent of a million. So you know, it all depends yeah. what projects you're doing. Yeah. Presumably, yeah. where you need the backers. Yeah. If you're doing a small, I mean, 50, I mean, the, the, the ironic thing is, the know. biggest deal I'm doing at the moment, which is the wine rack, I've got no backers on. Okay. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so that misfires that. So one. that misfires <laughs> that bit. But I can't do everything. You know, I, I you know, I've only got limited funds, like everyone. You can't. It doesn't matter who you are, if you won the lottery at 50, 100 million, you've still run out of money with property. You still, there's always another deal to do. There's always, so you always need backers. Can I, can I just, just make a comment? Because, you know, I've been involved in a lot of this activity over the last couple of years. And I personally think that a lot of developers have a very cynical approach to investors. And, I, you know, a lot of developers, they don't guarantee them an interest rate. They just ask them to come in and, and be you know, take all of the, the losses on a project if there are losses, and they think that's okay. And the reason why they think that's okay is because there have been a lot of people preaching that that is okay, and it's not okay. No, because, um, not. you know, these um, investors, you know, their money is worth a lot to them, and, you know, they're putting their trust and their faith yeah. in the developer, and, you know, they should be. Uh, you, you know that that should be returned, you know, in kind. Yeah. So, so and I, you know, I, you, yeah, I think also, Jane, you might be, t you know, in certain cases you're talking about maybe Andrew, where you might have 15 investors into one project. Well, you know, I tend to deal with multi-millionaires who say, oh, I'll do a couple of, do, a, I'll lend you a couple of million, John, to do a joint venture. So it, it, maybe I'm not saying it is, but maybe there's a number of, and if there's lots of different investors, then obviously. It's a bit different to what I do, um, and, and sounds a bit more painful, to be honest with you, because you've got a number of people to keep happy, rather than just the one person, um, perhaps. So, you know, but these wealthy people, they don't have to do deals with you. They can do it with someone else. It's a competitive world out there, and, you know, they've got a lot of money. They're probably fairly ruthless. <laughs> and although they're business friends, yeah? At the end of the day, if, if they can do a similar deal on their own without me, they'll do it and they'll go, if they've got the ability to, and go, no, John, I'm doing something myself, thanks. Don't want to do it. So, you know, you've got to look after them if you want to, if you want to um, succeed with them, if you like. So, so the numbers you've talked about, I mean, we're in the low interest rate at the moment, so if the interest rate changes, would your numbers change in terms of the amount of interest? No, not a lot, to be fair. Not a lot. I just think that at the end of the day, if, my view is this. If you can't afford to pay 10% interest on a deal, then you shouldn't be doing the deal in the first place. If you can't afford to pay 10% interest. Do you get bank funding for the principal? For the balance? Yeah, sometimes. So sometimes, they, sometimes they'll just... At the moment, um, I work with a, one of the guys. It's lovely because he's sold his company. So he's got quite a few million. So actually, that's lovely because... We're just using his cash, which is lovely. Or their cash, his marriage, his, his marriage. So it's both their cash, to be fair. So, so, um, but that is not always the case. Sometimes you might have a backer 
uh, who says, yeah, I'll put that in, but I'll fund the rest. Well, that's, that's up to them if they want to fund them. I don't, again, I don't get involved in that, really, on those. I do on my own, of course, but not on, not on that, not when I'm doing it with a joint venture. That's always their side of the deal. Yeah, always their side of the deal. Yeah. So is that fairly clear? Andrew, you got any queries on that? No, I just want to know the various terms. Where, I mean, obviously, if you've got first charge security versus second charge security, that makes quite a big difference to risk profile. So second charge? Who, who, who? I don't do second charges. Well, yeah, but if you if your backers are coming in and funding the principal balance, oh, I see. First yeah. charge security. If the bank is providing the main funding, yeah, sometimes, yeah. So does that change the terms that you're? Backers would get because normally if you're, you've only got the mezzanine bit, then no, 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 uh, they, they they get ten percent on the on the on the cash they put in, regardless of whether yeah. it's pre okay. very simple. Property's a simple business; you don't need to complicate yeah. it. It's just their risk changes quite a lot depending on which first or second charge that they're getting. You could argue that a little bit, but you know they're not these. You know they're confident and they know what they're doing, and and, and you know hopefully they, hopefully I know what I'm doing. So so. Uh, you know, but maybe I'm a bit of a dinosaur. Maybe things have moved on a little bit, and I should be a bit more, a bit more aggressive with my the amount I uh, I charge them. But uh, it's worked so far. So at the end of the day, if it's not broken, doesn't need fixing, does it? And you said if there if you if there was a loss on the deal, yes. you would then cover half the loss. I do. Yeah, yeah, of course. So you, yeah, you you share that they all want you to put some what's called skin in the game. They all do. Uh, and why would they say, well hang on a minute, I'm putting all the money in, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm using my experience and my expertise. Uh, yeah, but you're not, there's no, look, you know, hang on, if it all goes wrong, you can walk away and leave me with a mess. You can't, which I understand completely, I agree with them. But I want to use my cash. If I've got all cash in, I might as well do it myself. So, I don't need them. So... I think, isn't there also the, um, you know, the the benefit of offering them a, a really good return like that and, and some security as well is that you can work with, with one high net worth individual yeah. and it Absolutely. just if, if you try to aggregate it, investors apart from the FCA regulations because you've got to be that yeah. this is all private money so we yeah. don't have any of those. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it, it just gets really complicated it, having yeah. to manage Absolutely, it's a full-time job, man. Do you know what it's a bit like? It's a bit like when I had a racing yard at home, yeah. and you got you've got a syndicate, and you've got yeah. twelve of them. They all think they own the racehorse. Yes. You can only get four tickets for the for the paddock. They all want to go in the paddock, talk to the jockey, tell the jockey what to do, of course, because they're experts. Yes. Yeah, they've got one twelfth of the horse. Yes. Uh, it's a bit like that, you know. And actually, you can't do that. You can't have that. You know, if I'm the trainer. I talk to the jockey and we work the tactics out ourselves yes. and hopefully the jockey does what he's told. Yes. If not, you don't book him for the next ride. Mm -hmm. You make sure that your booking agent books another one. Yes. So, you know, and that's that's how it that's how it works. Any other questions before we wrap up? Um, anything else you'd like to, to quick us to quickly touch? We've done it's five o'clock just about. Any, so. any location specific? Ah, very good question. So, earlier, you might have missed it, but earlier we said, basically, um, and it is a bit of a, I appreciate this, a bit of an overall, but north, north for yield, north for rental yield, south for capital gain. Now, in that, in with, within that, obviously, there are exceptions to every rule. I'm not saying there aren't, but in principle, that's how we've always worked. Um, Exceptions, and I think Paul made a very good point earlier about you know um, urban centres. Urban centres, I like that because urban, like Manchester, Birmingham, Birmingham, I think it's got some real growth in it yet because of the um, H S two S two and everything else. Uh, Manchester has had that growth really, to be fair, quite quite a lot of growth. We talked about Blackpool, didn't we? Were you here when we spoke about Blackpool? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Right. So so. In the south, remember, there is a massive shortage of housing. Massive shortage of housing. A lot of people want to live down south. Up north, I can buy you a house for 20,000 still. I can buy you a flat in Glas outside Glasgow for 15,000 probably. 17,000. Not to say you want them. Some of these areas, they pay the tenant the first month's rent to go in. So they give them rent free the first month and cash back to the tenant to get them in because there's no, they can't, 
you know, they haven't got enough tenants to go in these places. So when people say, oh, there's a housing shortage across the UK, that's not quite true. It's not quite true. All right? Um, do you use backers even on smaller deals that you do? Like if you buy an individual bungalow, or would you just buy that for cash or what? No, yeah. no. no I wouldn't. Um, would okay. you even get finance on that, or would you just buy it outright? Yeah, we might, we might gear it up. We might, depending on what we've got on, you know, what I've got on, I might, I might gear it up. Um, yeah, I might do, uh, just, just really depends um, on, on what I've got going on at the time. Um, but normally, on something like that, we just pay cash for it and then we it yeah. or sell it. I mean, we don't do many like that, to be fair. Right. All right. Saying um, that you just pay cash for it, mm -hmm. um, I've always been told, keep the cash in reserve. Yes. And put, say, 50% down yes. and just keep the 50% yes. just as a borrowing. Yes. Um, I agree with that. Depends how much cash you've got at the time. And by the way, sometimes we have some. Sometimes we don't have very much because it's all out. You, when it's out, you want it in, and when it's in, you want it out. You, it's a bit like a farmer. It's either, it's either too wet or too dry. So <laughs> it's the same. So you're right. And it, if I got a, if I say I've got four, five, six things, small things on the go, which I pay cash for, and then I, I want to buy something at a lot more money, I think oh, God, I have to gear them up and. You know, we're all the same. We're all juggling. The levels might be different sometimes, but we're all juggling. And anyone who says there isn't, they are, they're not juggling with property, and they have a good year, and then they've, they've got, they haven't sold anything, so the cash flow is a bit tight. And then next year they've got, they're doing really well. And you know, normally every other year is a good year in property because it takes that time to buy, refurbish, and sell. So unless you're, unless you can get it right, so every year you've got something completing and being sold and someone a very well known property developer said to me once a really impressive man said to me once said John always keep your money moving always have something selling always have money coming in keeps the banks happy keeps everyone happy and the way to do that is through auctions because quite often I'm sticking something in an auction that I bought somewhere else stick it in you get your money within a month so it does keep cash flow going yeah. all the time. So keep your money moving. It's really, really important. All right? How's that? Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. No, thank you. We've, thank you. So that's whiz-by. 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 So thank you very much.